you know uh, the date uh, Rawadani? Excuse me. Until Friday. Oh, until Friday. Yes. This coming Friday? Uh, uh on the next Friday. Okay. So uh, once again, uh, welcome to this uh, international virtual courses. Enjoy the course. Enjoy the discussion. Brought in uh, your network, and of course, uh, stay safe and healthy uh, during the course. So uh, by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I declare that uh, international virtual course of the Physical Engineering Department of uh, ITB formally open. Uh, thank, thank you very you much. So much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you so much uh, for Professor Rido for uh, officially opening our virtual course. Uh, next, we are going to listen an opening remarks uh, from this event's chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, Bapak Dr. Wahyudi Parnadi. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Uh, MC. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, respectable Dean of Faculty of Mining and Petroleum uh, Engineering of Institute of Technology Bandung, Professor Rido Watimina, the Honorable All Guest Lecturer of this International Virtual Course, and the Honorable All Participant of this uh, seminar. Ladies and gentlemen, uh -huh. I am Wahyudi Widyatmoko Parnadi, the coordinator of this international virtual uh, course. I'm very pleased to see you here and welcome all of you to this uh, course. This uh, two weeks uh, course is about geophysical for engineering and uh, environment. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very happy with uh, 193 participants in this uh, course, consisting of foreign student, 14 foreign student, and 179 uh, Indonesian participants. And we have totally 21 uh, lecturers uh, coming from Indonesia and also from uh, other countries. So uh, we will be happy to have you all here and welcome to our international uh, virtual course starts it, uh, today until the Friday, the 17th of uh, September. So thank you very much for uh, all your participation and I, uh, we hope that you will be, uh, get an informative uh, idea and uh, material from uh, prominent lecturers. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wahyudi, for the speech. Now uh, we will have a photo session. To all participants, please turn on the camera. And for uh, the committee, uh, please uh, help me to uh, screen cap the screen. We will divide the photo session in several slides. Uh, it's the committee ready? Yes, um, Okay, uh, we are going to do photo session for slide one first. Yes, in my screen, there are five slides. So we start from slides one. One, two, three. The next slides. One, two, three. The next slides. One, two, three. Okay, the next slides, one, two, three. Okay, the last one, one, two, three. Okay, 
Okay, thank you so much, Harmita, and thank you so much for all the participants for turning on the camera. Uh, next, we are going to continuing our meeting to the next agenda. That is to hear the keynote speech by Professor Dr. Joko Santoso from Institute Technology Bandung. The session will be moderated by uh, Dr. Wahyudi. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Joko and Dr. Wahyudi. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Our uh, lecture is about to begin. Please have a nice seat and thank you very much for preparing uh, yourself to join uh, this course. Our speaker today in the first session is uh, Professor Joko Santoso. And this is a short biography of uh, Professor Joko Santoso. Professor Joko Santoso was graduated for first and then received a postgraduate diploma in seismology from International Institute of Se Seismology and Earthquake Engineering, Tokyo, in Japan. And then Master of Science in Geotechnical Engineering from Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand, and uh, received a doctor engineering degree in geological engineering from ITP in 1990. Uh, Professor Joko Santoso served as a professor in exploration geophysics. She's also head of center for CO2 and flat gas utilization of ITB and also advisor to National Center of Excellence for CCS, CCUS, and ZRF. Currently, he serves as vice chairman of ITB Board of uh, Trustee. He was director of Institute of Technology uh, Bandung uh, 2005 uh, until 2010, and also former uh, rector of University of Indonesia 2012 until 2013. He was the director general of Higher Education, Ministry of Education and Culture from 2010 to 2014. As a geologist and geophysicist, he has some experience as a private consultant to some national and international oil and gas companies and engineering firms. He's a member of some professional international and national organizations, such as active member of Society of Exploration Geophysicists, SEG, US, active member of American Society of Petroleum Geologists, APG, US, Life member of Southeast Asian Geotechnical Society, Society, Innovation Association of Geologists, Geophysical Society of Indonesia, uh, when he was the president of this society on 2006 until 2008, and Indonesian Institute of Engineer as member, member of expert group and chairman of Earth Energy Engineering Chamber. Some award recognition received are Indonesian Development Medal, Life Member of Geophysical Society of uh, Indonesia, AIT, Hall of Fame, Honorary Fellow of Asian Federation of Engineer, and PhD in Engineering uh, Honorary from National United University, Thailand. Life Achievement Award from Geophysical Society of Indonesia, and the Order of Rising Sun with Golden Ray and the neck ribbon from the government of uh, Japan. Now, uh, Professor uh, Joko Santoso, please welcome to help your presentation. Okay. Thank you very much, Pak Wahyudi. So, can I share my screen? Okay, you can see my screen, right? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, all of the participants uh, and the committee, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Waalaikumsalam. Selamat siang. Uh, Hom swastiastu, namo buddhaya. Salam kebajikan and uh, 
Rahayu. So I would like to talk about the role of GOP6 in reducing of CO2 emission. So as, uh, as you know now, we are uh, facing with the problem of the uh, CO2, which uh, related to the uh, climate change. So this one, what I would like to talk, so I will uh, briefly talking about the, some introduction, which is related to the uh, carbon emission and energy. After that, uh, I will to talk about the carbon reduction and then energy supply and CO2 emission. And then after that, I will uh, talk about the role of geophysics in the carbon capture storage and carbon capture and utilization storage implementation. Uh, and then followed by the example of the uh, geophysics in uh, geothermal energy uh, development. And then uh, last by closing. So as an introduction, so if you see this picture, so uh, please don't make the perception that if we make the electrical vehicle, it means that our air is become clean. It's not something like that. As far as that uh, your vehicle is straight charging by the energy come from the fossil fuel yeah, or another uh, mm -hmm. energy that make some uh, CO2 emission, something like that. So what we have is like the this picture below. Picture above is because we have directly the emission in our car mm -hmm. because we use the diesel. But if we try to uh, generate the electricity from the uh, engine that use diesel itself, so it means we just move the uh, CO2 emission. So uh, there are nothing different actually. So actually to miss resection, what we have to do is we have to reduce from the uh, source itself. So in that case, uh, geophysics is more, is become important uh, as our effort to reduce the CO2. Okay, so uh, this, this one actual, actually is showing about the uh, economic predictions uh, that will be uh, achieved before the uh, pandemic. Actually, according to the calculation itself, that uh, in the 2016, you can see the list of the uh, uh, 10 big economy in the world, and it will be changed in the uh, 2050. And you can hear that the Indonesia will be in the fourth in the 2050. But don't forget that the development of economy itself, it will relate to the industry. And then because of the increasing industry, we need so much energy. And what happened? We will have uh, increasing the uh, CO2 in our air. So this one is another picture. So this one is in the, the our uh, satellite image from 1970s. So it's that still very dark, yeah, our world. But in 2005, it's become brighter. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It, it, it means that uh, we have uh, increasing in energy demand. Of course, in correlation with the increasing of energy demand, it means there is the more CO2 uh, emission. Then uh, there is another picture. If we see the Jakarta itself, so this one is in around 60s. What happened in 60s when so the Jakarta itself is very quiet. But on the other hand, on the 2050, so this one in the night itself is very bright. So there is the several light here. It means there is crowded car in the 
growth itself. And, and uh, below is in the 2015. Again, that will be related to the increasing energy demand that will correlate with the uh, CO2 emission uh, as well. Uh, this one is the prediction of AAPG, American Association of Petroleum uh, Geologists, on uh, 1995. Yeah? So they predict that the population will increase. Consequently, what happened? Energy demand also will increase. And we already see from some examples that due to the energy demand, then the CO2 emission also growing up. This one, another picture that uh, showing the uh, shifting of the uh, energy consumption uh, in the world. So the first, of course, we can see that the United States almost consume the biggest energy, but uh, it, it already shifting to the Asia itself. Yeah. You can see this one, this picture. Yeah. China is uh, mostly consumed about 21%. Yeah. And then uh, followed by Eurasia, 3%. And then Latin America, 8%. And then uh, Southeast Asia itself, included Indonesia, is about 11%. Don't forget, it means will relation will relate also the, to the increasing of the CO2 emission. So this one is the the uh, the some of the phenomena that caused by the uh, climate change that relate to the uh, CO2 emission about the fire and then drought and then also about the storm. Actually, we facing this kind of the phenomena, this kind of catastrophe that uh, already experienced nowadays. Now I would like to talk about the CO2 emission reductions. So why uh, geophysics can play an important role in uh, reducing of the CO2, especially using the uh, CCUS uh, technology. You can see this picture actually. Uh, while we produce the uh, fossil fuel itself, for example, is oil and gas. So uh, there is the gas. In the gas itself, there is the mixture yeah, between uh, many gas included CO2. So in that case, mm -hmm. so if we then try to generate the power station, so we'll have the uh, CO2 emission and then CO2 emission also will uh, should be captured. And then after it is captured, it should be purified. And after that, if we have already uh, purified CO2, we can put it in the subsurface by injection well. So we call it CO2 sink. Yeah? And then that we produce CO2, we call it CO2 source. So CO2 source itself could come instead of from the power generation, also could come from several factory, included cement plant, for instance, or another uh, energy uh, producer, such as coal and so on. And then what happened? After we sink the CO2 itself, so it means this one is our area as the geophysicists or geologists. So uh, what can see here, we, we have to characterize about the same location itself. First is about the reservoir itself. And then after that, the seal, or maybe we can call it as a cap rock that will protect from the CO2 that could be uh, going up again to the surface. Yeah. So that all of that one usually will be controlled, what we call it as the structural geology in the subsurface. So that one is become our area. So in that case, 
ya. If we want to reduce CO2 in large scale, so we can use this kind of uh, uh, technology. So I'm sorry, Pak Moderator, how long I have to speak? Pak Wahyudi? What is uh, the time allocation for me? Uh, you have still enough time. Uh, about uh, 20, 25 uh, minutes. 25 minutes more, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So this one is a scenario about how we try to combat this type of change that uh, already calculated by International Energy Association. So in that case, if we use the uh, CCUS, so uh, we can reduce up to 14%. Yeah. So in that case, uh, what we have to do right now is try to develop the technology itself, included, of course, the geophysics that could characterize about the reservoir and also the subsurface condition uh, for the sinks location. So if uh, we compare with renew renewable energy, yeah, according to the scenario of International Energy Association, which is in total is about 55 gigaton yeah, that could be reduced. And then the renewable energy itself could up to could reduce up to 30%. You can compare this number with the uh, CCS that can produce 14%. So for renewable energy, it means there are so many things that not uh, produce uh, CO2. Yeah. So in so we can say that this one, the CCS technology or CCS technology, is the important technology in the near future to reduce uh, CO2. Okay. In Indonesia itself, fortunately, we have. Uh, another energy that could also reduce the emission of the CO2, that one is the geothermal energy use. So, so we can reduce from CCS actually. Yeah. So our target is about 50 gigaton uh, of CO2 reduction yeah, in 2050. And this one is the, it's both kind of the, uh, technology could reduce the uh, CO2 emission. So what we have to do as the geophysicist is about the uh, subsurface storage and models and then monitoring. Yeah. So it means we will work in the area of exploration and also uh, development. So in both sides, uh, we can do related to the subsurface uh, condition. So if we talking about energy supply and emission of CO2, especially in Indonesia, we have the picture something like this. Yeah. So if uh, this one, if we take the statistic from uh, PP, that is petroleum, so we have the picture something like this. So we can compare. This one is uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Japan, and the world. So what we have here, yeah emission of the CO2 in Indonesia itself, it's around 450 uh, million ton of uh, CO2. Yeah. So you can compare with another country. So if the country itself, it develop, it mean, as we already see before from the illustration in the introduction. So for instance, if we compare to Japan, so Japan itself, because there are more industrialized country, and then what happened? They need so much energy, it means they have more emission. So almost uh, uh, two and a half of uh, Indonesia. Yeah. So that one is the, the, the picture of the uh, CO2 uh, emission itself. Mm. And then this one is if we compare between the uh, 
uh, geothermal in all whole of the world compared to Indonesia. So we are fortunate actually because yeah, if the total yeah, total primary energy supply from geothermal in the world is only 5%. On the other hand, if we compare to Indonesia, in Indonesia itself, we can go up to 7.7%. Yeah. So if we can develop the energy from geothermal, it means we can reduce the uh, the CO2 uh, in the uh, significant amounts that will be about the up to uh, 10%. Okay. Now, yeah, there one is a nudge picture about the, the emission. So this one, the total emission mm -hmm. in Indonesia. Yeah. So we are in in the rank of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it means big ten of the uh, CO2 uh, producing uh, country. Yeah. Why? Because uh, we have uh, developed so much electricity actually uh, from coal. Besides, also we use also gas and also from hydro. Uh, power. So in the future, actually, uh, the government already planning to make what uh, they call it or what we call it as the mixed energy target. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the left hand side, we can see here the proportion of the use of energy from several sources. Yeah. So in that case, uh, the first is still we use the oil and gas in the 2025, yeah. And then after that, we still use the gas, and then also with the coal, that up to 30 percent. In the 2050, we we want to reduce the use of the uh, oil and gas, as and also, uh, I'm sorry, the use of uh, oil and also the use of the uh, coal. So that one, we want to uh, have more use of the energy that produced from the new and renewable energy, this one, the green one. So this one, if uh, we want to see the comparison, yeah, the development what already we experience using uh, several energy sources. Yeah, so we can see here that the green one actually from uh, renewable energy. Yeah, and then the geothermal is the this one, the brown one, and then the hydropower is the uh, with the uh, green one. Yeah. So this one is our experience that of course we want to increase of with the geothermal and another new and renewable uh, energy. Yeah. This one, another picture, actually. Okay. And, uh, and uh, this one is uh, if we compare the development of the uh, uh, electricity generated from the uh, fossil. Uh, fuel and then from the uh, new and renewable energy so we can we want to have such kind of the scenario in the 2050 it means that we more used in new renewable energy on the other hand we try to reduce about the use of the uh, fossil uh, fuel and then this picture showing the about the uh, the uh, percentage of the geothermal contribution to the electricity yeah, up to 2018. Yeah. So this one is about the uh, of the geothermal, and then the this one is the total of the uh, uh, electric uh, generating power. As I mentioned before, that it could be 
up to 10%, the value itself in total. So if we have the CCS up to 14%, and then the geothermal could reduce up to 10%. So in that case, we can have uh, much amount of the CO2 reduction, uh, and all of them is will be related to the application of the geospatial itself. Yeah. So you can already can see this one before, this one the calculation, 14% of the 40 gigaton CO2 reduction will be done by CCS. On the other hand, 10% of the 40 gigaton will be done by utilization of the geothermal uh, energy. Yeah. And combined, probably we can uh, push up to 24%. Yeah. And then uh, I will talk about the end example of the role of the geophysics itself. Yeah. So if we follow the CCS2 technology to study about the uh, subsurface, yeah, so we can follow this diagram from Gibson and Paul 2009. So in that case, our example will be in East Java Basin. And then we go to Gundi area. In, in that Gundi area, there is several fields. And we can go to the uh, field, what we call it Kedung Tuban field. And we go to Kujung formation. So in that matter, so it means we have to define or we have to characterize carefully about the injectivity. It means we will talk about the reservoir, and geometry, connectivity, and so on. And then also about the containment, it will be related to geomechanic, seal and capacity, and then hydrodynamic. So, and then about the capacity itself. So, how much that we can uh, inject the CO2 in that area. So, we need the study about the structural model as well as also stratigraphic model. Of course, some background study about the tectonic and the geology area is uh, should be done uh, before. Now we can try to see something like that. So we, if we have the tool of geophysics, so we can go to what we call it geoscience characterization, static from structural model like the picture before, and then stratigraphy, injectivity, containment capacity, and what we can call it as that we can develop what is static model. Through the static model, and then our our college from the petroleum engineering, we can study about the dynamic model, and then follow by all of the facilities in the surface that could be done by the groups of the chemical engineering. So, in that case, our area is talking about the storage. It means the reservoir as well as also the seal. You can add also in this picture. And then after the the the, the uh, injection was done, so we have to monitor it for the safety in the future. So uh, this one actually the history that we already a long time to uh, develop the activity in that area. Actually, we uh, already apply so many uh, geophysical uh, methods. But uh, in this example, I just want to talk about the uh, seismic and gravity, actually. It, sorry, in only uh, about the seismic itself. And uh, in this picture, we can see some support that comes from the, from the funding of the activity itself from numerous sources. Mostly is from the uh, uh, Japan side and also from uh, Asia Development uh, Bank. Okay, so this one is our area actually in East Java, as I mentioned before. So this one is the area what we call it Gundi area. So in that area we have the Rantu Batu, yeah, yeah, and then this one is Kedung Tuban, and then this one is uh, Kedung Usi. This area what we call it is the Gundi area. So uh, close to the uh, Kedung Tuban itself, there is the uh, CPP, yeah, uh, Central uh, Gas Processing Plant here, yeah? that uh, 
we can purify the gas in that uh, area. Okay, this one is the stratigraphy of the uh, uh, Guli area. What we have is here, uh, what we call it Kujung formation, actually. Kujung formation, it will become the location of our reservoir that we will uh, inject the, uh, the uh, CO2. And above the, uh, this formation, actually, we have tuban formation that could be become the uh, con, uh, become the candidate for the seal on the cat rock of the our uh, reservoir, and uh, in that area actually is about the reef that uh, built in the platform, and then so uh, there is the cal what we call it calcite turbidite uh, units above the uh, Kujung formation that we can see before the expression in the seismic uh, feature. So, mm -hmm. uh, so this one is we can see if we try to make the well correlation, we can have the picture something like that. So this blue line is showing the top of the Kujung formation. And as, as I mentioned before, above of the uh, Kujung formation, there is in the build up of the reefs. So in that case, actually in that area, we would like to, uh, to inject, you know, that in, in the blue one, we try to inject the uh, CO2. Okay, this one in the, uh, the showing the uh, seismic data what we have. Uh, we have the 3D seismic data and also we, we have 2D uh, seismic uh, data. And then we, if we make some interpretation, so we have that uh, blue color, this one, light blue color. So this one is the top Kujung formation. So as, as I mentioned before, above of the uh, Kujung formation, there is the reef built up. So that we have uh, this one, this uh, color, yeah. okay? And then we have uh, this one, another color. Yeah. So the area that we want to make the, uh, the, uh, the injection is in the field of Kedung uh, Tuban, this way, ETP, yeah, in that area, okay? So by using that data, actually, we can map about the uh, top of the seal itself, yeah? And then the top of the calci turbidite, this one is the reef, and then the top of the nimbang and the top of the kujung, kujung. So nimbang is below the kujung uh, formation, okay? And then, this one, if we more detail, try to make the isopach map yeah, about the calciturbidite and also about the Kujung formation. That in that area, we, won't, we would like to make it become the reservoir for our uh, uh, injection. So this one is a similar picture actually, and the below uh, picture is showing the, the, the position of the top kujung and also the bottom of kujung or uh, near top of nimba. Okay, this one, some of the picture from the uh, seismic uh, analysis. Yeah. I think we, I can uh, show the bigger picture in the next slide. So this one, we can actually we make some uh, geo model yeah, by guided by the seismic infection. So we can have the porosity distribution yeah, or as well as also permeability distribution in our uh, candidate for the reservoir in the future. Yeah, This one that I mentioned before, that the map is showing very small one, but this one is much bigger, that we can see the average of the 
uh, uh, saturation and then average of the permeability and then porosity and also the velocity. Okay, so currently, actually, uh, actually, the Gundefit itself is released about 300 ton per day of the CO2. So we want to uh, reduce yeah, 3 million CO2 within 10 years. So it means uh, if we use the CO2 to force the uh, gas in the area of the production itself, we will have the incremental up to 36 uh, BSCF, yeah, billion standard cubic feet for 10 years. It means we will have about the uh, value uh, about approximately 120 million US dollars. And then on the other hand, we need some uh, operational ex expenditure and capital expenditure for 10 years, about 35 million uh, US uh, dollars. So, so that one is the uh, about the application of geophysics in the uh, uh, CCS and CCUS. On the other hand, I will talk about a little bit about the in geothermal utilization. So actually, in the geothermal exploration, if we use the scarcity method, we can uh, look at both the heat source and also some subsurface structure. On the other hand, magnetic will be related to heat source in the ultra zone. And magnetic mm -hmm. telluric also will have some uh, indication of the cap rock, top reservoir, reservoir delimitation and heat source. And after that, if we apply in the micro uptake, we will have the permeability zones. But in this uh, example, I will not show all of this, uh, this method actually, only some uh, example that probably related to magnetic and then residual and then um, electromagnetic, uh, and then supported by another geology and geochemistry uh, uh, investigation results. So this one is the area that we already investigate, yeah? close to Bandung, in the uh, Tangkuban Prau Mountain. So we have the model, something like that. So the heat source itself is related to the uh, magma from the uh, Tangkuban Rao Mountains that is going up, something like this. And then in the here in the surface, we can see some of the uh, expression uh, as the crater. There are many craters in that uh, volcano. Yeah. So there is the what we call it the uh, Kawah Ratu or Ratu Crater, Baru Ratu, Upas Crater, and then Duhmas Crater. Yeah. At, in that area, actually, we have nine craters in total. Yeah. So this one is actually uh, our model from the uh, geological investigation that we can draw and then we can see here from the uh, geochemistry results and uh, from the geochemistry result itself, we can produce what is the uh, temperature of the uh, reservoir below as shown in this uh, number. Okay. So this one is the constructed uh, geothermal conceptual modeling using the uh, geophysical data. Yeah. So we have the picture, something like that. Yeah. Actually, we, we derive this picture from result of the resistivity investigation that using the electromagnetic, yeah. sorry, resistivity value using the electromagnetic, and then also using the gravity mm -hmm. that uh, we can see uh, and then we can make the model of the uh, 
geothermal field in uh, Tangkuban Perahu. So this one, if we try to see in detail, so we can is the, you can see here the first is about the uh, this one is resistivity in line one, and then in the top this this below is gravity model, yeah, and then uh, sorry I cannot see this sorry. Okay, and then, uh, sorry, ah. and then after that, of course, from all of the data, from all of the model that we already get from the uh, our uh, many methods, and then we can combine it together, and then we can make the final model of the uh, geothermal. Uh, condition in that uh, area. So the model itself is about something like that. So we have here heat source. Yeah. That one is actually derived from the gravity value. And then the structure is mostly is derived from the uh, electromagnetic results. Yeah. So we can see some structures that uh, derive from the uh, the uh, derived from the electromagnetic uh, investigation result. So we can say that above of the heat source itself, we have the upflow here. Yeah. Uh, but this one, we can find this one is uh, Kawah Ratu yeah, and also Kawah Upas. But on the other end, theater is located in the outflow area. So probably from this side and then this the water move to that side and then coming up here. On the other hand, going also to Kancha here. And then there is the indication, thermal indication in that uh, area. Okay. So I think that's all that I would like to mention. Uh, and as the closing, so actually, and the geophysics itself is has the very important role if we want to apply the CCS or CCS technology. On the other hand, if we want to develop the geothermal energy itself, it is also very important because we will, uh, what we call it is uh, we develop in the uh, upstream uh, area. Yeah. So it means about the geoscience characterization. And then we develop the model. After that, we follow with the monitoring. So in relation to the uh, carbon reduction share, we can share from Indonesia is up to 24%. I think that's all that I would like to mention in this uh, short lecture. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm sorry, sir. The, the time is very interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the question and answer session. I'd like to have some questions from the past participants, uh, please. Please write down in the chat room your question. Is there any question? Uh, Pak Indra? So there is the question from uh, Miss or Miss, Mrs. Miss Erina Prasianti. What are the drawbacks of CCS technology? Uh, could you help me? What, what um, does it mean by the drawbacks? Uh, um, it, it means, uh, is there any disadvantage of using the CCS okay. technology? 
Go advantage. Uh, I'm this, uh, this advantage. This advantage. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what? Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation, Mr. Joko. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ibu uh, Irina. Okay. What is the advantage of the uh, CCS uh, or CCUS technology? So I myself is the as the develop one of the developer for the uh, CCS CCUS technology. Actually, uh, I can say there is uh, no uh, disadvantage of this technology, but there is some risk, of course. Yes, there is some risk of the uh, this technology. For instance, in relation to the uh, there is uh, the possibility that the this carbon that we already inject in the reservoir could uh, come back again to the uh, to the surface. So uh, in that case, we have to work very carefully. Uh, as our experience, actually, the first, the first we want to uh, inject the CO2 itself in the uh, in the field. What we call it, we have one well there. We call it is Japan one well. But after we make some investigation, there is the leakage of the gas in that. Uh, well actually so that well actually is already old well and then we want to renew um, that well but unfortunately we see some leakage of the gas in that uh, area and then that is why and then we try to move in the to the uh, Kedung Tuban field nearby the uh, the Japan one well that uh, showing some leakage I think the problem is only related to that uh, problem that may happen. And then secondly, of course, there are so many uh, what uh, technological uh, problems that uh, we should uh, solve before we start and continue the injection it, itself. Uh, for instance, in related to the uh, CCUS itself, because if we already inject the CO2 in the reservoir and then we produce uh, gas, what happened that the gas that we inject is also follow the, uh, our new gas that we produce. And then we, could, we should separate again. So the main costly that we work with CCS is about the separation, that is the the big cost that we, we need. So I think that one is uh, some several uh, disadvantage of the use of the, the CCUS, of course. And then we have to calculate the uh, economic situation itself. If it is still economic, so it has a problem. So we can try to uh, solve many things of will be Happen, and uh, and fortunately, because the the the, the CO two itself is uh, worldwide problems, and nowadays, uh, even we can what we can trade the uh, CO two itself. So there is the trading, so our activity could be shared with another company or another country, something like that. And then the reduction also could be shared. And now this also with, because after that will go to the, what we call it carbon tax. Well, actually there is actually long chains of the uh, activity. I hope that one already answered your question, Miss Irina. Yes, thank you, sir. Man, what is what are can do as a chief sister is to other than injecting it to the earth? So, 
uh, there is the, another question here. I would like to know more about the current uh, latest CCS development in Indonesia. Is, is there any ongoing project lately? Yeah. So there is the question from uh, Kevin, actually. Uh, yes. uh, well, actually, uh, in Indonesia itself, about the uh, CCS, we we just start with the, some study with that I already explained uh, because the study itself, and then we need some preparation, including all of the uh, what capital expenditure, yeah, not only in the capital expenditure, but also the all of the uh, uh, utility, all of the infrastructure that we can start in the injection, it needs several years. So like what I mentioned in Kundi itself, so we want to have injection started from, uh, we already start right now, our work actually, we hope that we can start to inject is about 2024 or 25. So after all is completed, even now we already also have to prepare about the uh, regulation on the this application of this technology. All right. Thank you, sir, for the answer. Yeah. So there is the question: What can do as a geophysicist to reduce CO two after thing into thing into the earth? Well, actually, as a geophysicist, we work in the uh, subsurface. So in that case, uh, why we have the role to reduce CO2 because we work in the uh, subsurface. But uh, after that, of course, the CO2 source itself is, will not only come from the, uh, our uh, related uh, industrial activity, but also will come on all of the factory. For instance, from related from this cement production, yeah? ammonia production and then also the, that I mentioned before is about the electricity generation mm -hmm. so that one is will be become the source in uh, CCS or CCS uh, perspective and there is from Leonardo uh, will this CCS have negative impact on the ecosystem where carbon is stored it's uh, then within the store carbon dioxide can have economic value. Lastly, is there any quick geological disaster? And then, and so on. Yes, of course. Yeah, the first is about the ecosystem. As far as the carbon, uh, CO2 that we store or we inject in the reservoirs is remain there, it will be no problem to our uh, environment. And uh, secondly, uh, the carbon dioxide itself is has the economic value. Nowadays, people also talking about the carbon recycling. Some of them is uh, talking about how we can use uh, carbon and then we can try to produce uh, methane from carbon. So that one is the, the area of the uh, chemical engineering uh, side, actually. And then uh, if there is disaster, of course, we have to calculate the possibility of the uh, uh, earthquake, for instance, in certain area that if it is uh, very have risk, probably we have to cal calculate about the fault activity. So what we try to do, one of the the technology that we applied, what we call it the geomechanics. So it means we calculate what is the maximum of the, uh, the increasing uh, force or increasing uh, uh, stress condition in the reservoir after we inject it. So that one also should be calculated in uh, because by that calculation, we can have some uh, more safe uh, activity in the future. Of course, that would be calculated as well. I think that's all the uh, some question that I could read 
in the in the uh, chat rooms. Thank you, Pak Wahyudi. Okay, uh, uh, no other questions. Yeah, I think. Do you have? Uh, do you still have time, or is this enough for you? Well, well, maybe in yes, five minutes, yes, please. If still there is, but I think I don't see any more question. Oh. Or maybe some question from you, Pak <laughs> Oh, okay. <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's uh, enough for you, Pak Joko, because you have, you must uh, take another uh, task uh, today. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we finally come to the end of this uh, section. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Joko Santosa for the informative and interesting presentation and all the participants for the very active particip participation. Finally, give the applause for the speaker and for you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, time and place uh, return to MC. Okay, so can I go to uh, another meeting, Pak Wahyudi? Yes, please, Pak Joko. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, for the next uh, agenda, uh, we will have a second session that will start in uh, 1430 uh, with uh, Professor Kuo. To everyone, uh, you can have a break for now and uh, see you at uh, 1430. We still have a 20, uh, 20 minutes for a break. Uh, I will remind you one time uh, for everyone who haven't uh, submit the attendance list. Uh, please check out the attendance list uh, form on the chat box. Thank you.
uh, joining us. Joining us today is an expert from National Central University Taiwan. Uh, he is uh, Assistant Professor Chen Xiang Kuo, uh, and I will read a short uh, CV uh, from uh, Professor Kuo. Okay. Uh, Professor uh, Chen Xiangko is from National Central University. Uh, he is have a PhD from uh, National Central University, and uh, he already over uh, 50 journal and paper public publications, and over uh, 399 uh, citations in uh, publication. And this is a, a short latest publication from him. And today, uh, he will give a lecture about impact of nail fall post like ground motion on building case study in Taiwan. Uh, let's welcome Professor Chen Xiang Kuo. Uh, Professor Kuo, it's uh, so good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, uh, maybe before uh, we start our today class, Pak Yudi. Uh, do you have any something to say before we start uh, our class? Okay, maybe Professor Ku can uh, start directly. Uh, okay. This, uh, yeah. Okay, Pak Wahyudi. Uh, and then uh, now let's start our class. Uh, Professor Ku, you have about uh, 50 minutes to give your uh, lecture and following with uh, 20 minutes for uh, discussion, please. Okay. Um, um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, the chairman, and thank you, uh, Professor Wayuti. I would like to start my talking. Yes, please. Um, Okay, let me share my screen. Now, could you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm very happy to be here um, to share with the students and also uh, the colleagues from ITB, uh, the some recent result of our, our research in Taiwan. The topic of my presentation today is the impact of near fall post like ground motions on buildings. The case study in Taiwan. Um, I am Jun Shang Guo from National Central University in Taoyuan, Taiwan, and I am also a uh, uh, as John Research Fellow from National Center for Research on Earthquake Engineering. Because in the past 10 years, I was working for ANCRI um, in Taiwan. So I, I have um, experience on the engineering application of using geophysical techniques and also um, seismic seismological uh, techniques in engineering application. Okay, firstly, I would like to introduce some of my research interests. Um, the first is a shallow shear wave velocity structures. Um, actually, we use several geophysical methods to investigate the shear wave velocity profile for shallow sedimentary layers. Um, we use, the method we use include the invasive, uh, several different invasive um, logging methods and also several non-invasive methods like SSW and MSW, which is a positive source method. And we also try to use passive method like microtrimmer array method. 
So we focus on the strata we step less than three kilometers because they are very important on the seismic side effect during strong motion. And we also delineate bedrock contour in Western Plain of Taiwan. This is a case of the map. Uh, we delineate the bedrock depths using microtrimer method. And also we develop the first VS30 Z1.0 relationships for Taiwan. Um, there are also two VS30 Z1 point relationship in California and also in Japan currently. And the second is about the side effect parameter for our strong motion networks. The so-called VS30 is the average shear wave velocity in top 30 meters which has been widely used for several decades in engineering, seismology, and also the building codes in many, many countries. In recent years, advanced GMPE further used the different, a different new parameter called Z1.0, which means the depth to a horizontal layer with Vs larger than one kilometer per second to account for the basin depth in the ground motion prediction equations. Um, the purpose is to better estimate ground motions. <clears throat> and also kappa non, which is an important uh, parameter account for the, the high frequency seismic wave attenuation. And we also investigated the three major side parameters for strong motion stations uh, of more than 800 stations in world Taiwan. So we can plot the, the uh, contour for the three parameters for world Taiwan. And the next is, is related to the topic today. Uh, we studied the near fall strong motions especially for the post-like velocity ground motions, um, which tend to cause significant damage for, build, for middle and high-rise buildings. And uh, um, uh, I joined the, the research use both numerical simulation and also shaking table test in two different groups to study the, the effect of velocity of velocity posts on the buildings. And the, the result from different from two different uh, research groups use different approach. Both show the uh, the building, the damage of the building uh, was caused by the soft layer in the first floor. This is a, a major cause of the velocity pulse to cause severe damage on high rise and mid middle rise buildings. <clears throat> and then is the nonlinear side response analysis. Uh, complicated nonlinear behavior becoming dominant in side effect when suffering large Trend during strong motions. So we check the obvious linearity of PGA and also use V over H ratio um, versus the strength parameter PGV divided by VS30 during an, uh, an earthquake. And we also find and try to quantify the increase of damping ratio the so-called quality factor of different frequencies during strong motion using a smart one array in Taiwan. And also a side response model include linear and also nonlinear effect has been proposed recently to capture the entire side response behavior of PGA, PGV, and the acceleration in different periods. This study will be present 
during the World Conference of Earthquake Engineering uh, in, in next month. Th this is uh, uh, the research, the interest of research of um, me and also several colleagues in Taiwan. And I will also would like to deliver some information of our institutes and also research centers in Taiwan. First is my department, the Earth Department of Earth Science, National Central University. <clears throat> you can, if you are interested in our department, you can visit the link. And also recently, we have a video introduce our school. Uh, maybe I can share the video of, of, about um, about two minutes, maybe I can share the video with you. Could you see the YouTube? Yes. Okay, but um, The sound is not yet set. Okay, there is no sound. Uh, Let me... You should uh, stop the share first. And stop the share. Yes, and uh, you can share screen and, and, and check the sound, the sound, share the sound. Check the, the sound. left bottom of window share. No, um, I have to stop and then share again. Share screen and uh, before uh, share, there is a checkbox on the bottom left of your Zoom window. Okay, okay. Okay, I see it. There is a button. Yes. United Research. Okay. Hey, have you ever imagined studying in NCU? NCU is one of the elite Taiwanese universities. We have 12,000 students, 8 colleges, 28 departments, 18 graduate institutes, 7 university level research centers, 1 united research center and the affiliated Zhongli Senior High School. Our research programs extend to diverse fields. We range from astronautical physics and engineering research programs high energy and high field physics research program, earthquake disaster and risk evaluation and management research program, cognitive intelligence and precision healthcare research program, environmental monitoring and technology research program, to space and remote sensing research program. Moreover, astronomical observation research program at Lu Ling Observatory. When it comes to social science, sex, gender, film, cultural research, hacker culture, Eastern and Western performing arts, finance and business management, we deliver excellent performances. NCU has the global vision where cultural literacy meets science. We have more to offer. Our own movie theatre, Cinema House 107. This exclusive campus theatre is unprecedented in Taiwan. Not to mention the professional black box theatre space in which workshops and artistic performances are happening regularly. For the moment, we have around 270 overseas sister universities, including exchange program, dual degree program, and language studies. NCU has more than 1,000 international students, and newcomers have doubled over the past three years. 
80% of which are from new southbound countries. NCU has more than 100 student clubs, including various group extracurricular activities. How about launching a business? We have the IDEA NCU Student Network, creating lots of social opportunities for you to try out and manifest yourself. NCU has planted 1,500 pine trees. They are all around. Pine is the campus tree that symbolizes our spirit, leading us stride forward with head high. Sincerity in knowledge, simplicity in life. How could we illustrate all the merits of NCU in merely three minutes? As for the rest, we leave it for your own expedition to find out. Okay, um, and uh, we also have a research center about earthquake disaster and risk evaluation and management in NCU. And about I, my pre, uh, the institute I stayed previously, the entry, you can also find some uh, information from this link. Um, so I would like to start the, the issues of today's talk about the near for ground motions. <clears throat> that is uh, the definition, the original definition is for magnitude larger than seven and uh, uh, the distance within 20 kilometers from the active, from the uh, casual four ruptures. Um, there was an article published in BSSA, there is a, sent, a paragraph said, as of mid 1999, there were only eight such strong motion records in the world. After nearly 70 years of effort in strong motion monitoring, <clears throat> the Kaleli Turkey earthquake of 17 August 1999 country built five more such records. And the Chichi Taiwan earthquake of 20 September 1999 country built another over 60 such records. So thanks to the deployment of over 1000 strong motion instruments in the past three years. Um, so this introduction let us know Actually, such a raker can call near for ground motions was very limited uh, at least before this the before this century it's very limited. And uh, the Chichi earthquake occurred in Taiwan is a uh, one of well known large magnitude earthquake in engineering size March. <clears throat> the outline today what we would do is what is a near fall ground motion? And then how can we identify the post-like ground motions? And the third is we constructed a database of near fall strong motions with post-like velocity. And then I will talk about the effect of the post-like waveform on artificial structures. And finally, summary. Why the near fall ground motion is important? Because in the case of Taiwan, more than one third population are exposed to the stress of near fall ground motions because there are several active folds. As you can see, the red line delineated here, illustrated here, the Red line is the active fall in Taiwan. And then when you see the figure in the, uh, in the center, 
there are several uh, disaster earthquakes in Taiwan uh, in the past in the uh, past 100 years <clears throat> uh, caused severe damages and fatalities. And most of the earthquakes, this disaster earthquakes occurred on land uh, and majorly by the active fault. Only several of the earthquakes were subduction earthquakes for Taiwan. Of course, I know um, in the case of Indonesia, maybe the subduction earthquake is the, uh, is the most disaster earthquake in Indonesia. And for the figure in the right is the seismic hazard map for 10% uh, exit percentage in the coming 50 years. This is the latest result proposed last year, uh, published last year. <clears throat> and uh, we can see the seismic hazard for various return period in terms of the peak ground acceleration, the unit in G. <clears throat> we can see there are several regions, the hazard level is even larger than one G in Taiwan. So especially the region near active fault. So we know the region near active fault may cause a, various, a very severe shaking. And also it will bring the very significant structure and building damage. And the entry in Tainan, uh, several years, it uh, entry constructed a new laboratory in South Taiwan, include two important uh, <coughs> facilities. One called BAS is a biatral dynamic testing system. And another is a design for simulation of near fall ground motions. That is a long stroke high speed earthquake simulator. The engineers can put some specimen of different structure on the shaking table. And then we, um, the engineers can um, <clears throat> make earthquakes and to check how the damage on the structure from different type and different amplitude of the earthquakes. This is one case of the of the um, test. Oh, I have to show, I have to share the voice. You can see um, the check table will stimulate it a lot strong motion with strong forces. Here comes the large force. Okay. 
Okay, as you can see in the video, um, the shake table is a A meter multiplied by A meter large shake table. And you can see the people stand here as a scale to this structure, to this uh, two layer structure. And we can, uh, <clears throat> engineers can design uh, almost full scale statement on the shake table to do tests. And actually the important effect on the engineering design for near four region includes several important effects. First, we may call the hanging wall effect. As you can see in this figure, the hanging wall effect was um, for example, this is a profile and this is a fault. And you can see this is a handing wall region. This is a food wall region. In the handing wall region, there are usually larger, uh, stronger ground motion than in food wall region. And this is because in the handing wall region include, usually include the so-called handing wall effect that will be explained later again. And also the second is the rupture directivity effect. The effect will inf uh, influence full frequency band. This is a figure, the illustration for rupture directivity effect. This is a, so this, this star is a seismic source and the arrow is the direction of the uh, rupture of the uh, active fault and the triangles are several different stations. <clears throat> this station was on the direction, the rupture pro uh, propagate. So you can see the seismic, um, there are several triangles to indicate the source time function. And the source time function will in place, we are placed together in a very short, short duration. And in the, in another direction, the seismic wave, the uh, active role, uh, active fall rupture away. The source time function <coughs> will be longer than the direction the rupture propagate to. And in average, this is a average source time function here. <clears throat> so this is the effect called rupture directive, directivity effect. And the third is a permanent displacement. Usually in the region near the, the fall rupture, the dislocate of the fall will produce a displacement that we can observe in the displacement waveform. However, this, this per, permanent displacement waveform have to be correct first, and then we can get such kind of waveform. And you can see there are uh, the displacement in different components of the waveform. And compared to the, um, to the black, black line, the black line is a displacement derived from um, the GPS station close to the strong motion station. So we can get, actually we can get similar displacement from the strong motion record and also from the GPS record. <clears throat> and this is another very important near fall effect. This is a, a explanation of handing wall effect. There are two stations have uh, the same distance from the fall rupture. This is in the handing wall and this is in the foot wall with the distance of D. And then the handing wall, however, the handing wall station will suffer much stronger ground motion than foot wall station because of the geometry distribution 
of the stations. <coughs> this is one case. Sorry, this is one case from Northridge. From Northridge earthquake in California. The left, the full distance of the negative value is the uh, range, is a range of food wall. And in the right is a region of hanging wall. Hanging wall can sh show larger ground motion than food wall. This is another case from Chichi earthquake. In the right is the hanging wall region. In the left is a full wall region. Again, hanging wall region show larger ground motion in average than the food wall region. And this is the amplification factor in terms of different period. So the horizontal component and also the vertical component show in a circle and show in a rectangular, uh, in an open square, both show a larger, both show a large amplification factor in the, in the hanging wall region. So this is called the hanging wall effect due to the like, uh, geometrical location of the station and the four rupture plane. <laughs> the second is the rupture directivity effect and the result post-like velocity. Um, this is a case from 1992 Landers earthquake. This is epicenter, and there are three segments of a fall rupture during this earthquake. The earthquake, the fall rupture from the epicenter to the nose. And then there is a station in the nose observed such kinds of velocity waveform, which has a post like velocity. Um, for normal direction due to far field SH wave radiation. Because this is strike the fall, and in the four normal direction, usually the far field SH radiation pattern is important. So this effect will cause a long period, large amplitude velocity waveform. And in another direction, the waveform is observed here, but the waveform is very is significantly different from the, the one in the forward directivity region. This one has longer duration, but much lower amplitude and higher frequency. <clears throat> and the station in the forward directivity region has two horizontal components. One is trinormal, another is triparallel. The trinormal waveform is like this, have a very large amplitude. And if we integrate it again, we can get the displacement waveform included a per, per minimum displacement. For the triparallel direction, there is also a large velocity waveform, and we integrated the velocity waveform again. We can get another displacement waveform with permanent displacement, with another permanent displacement, because this is a tri slip fall. So in the triparallel direction, there is an important displacement here. So this is a permanent displacement we just showed. And uh, before we can get a per permanent displacement from the displacement waveform, we have to do baseline correction to remove the drift of the baseline caused by the tears or rotation during strong motion shaking. So after this correction, you can get a 
displacement waveform with similar permanent displacement compared to the result indicated by the GPS. And for uh, uh, another research, this research compare the displacement waveform with the high rate GPS. The GPS is one hertz. That means it has one ray curve in every second. So the GPS can got the blue displacement and uh, the cold station strong motion strong motion waveform. We can got almost the same displaced waveform compared to the GPS station. In the during the Toku earthquake in the station AKT 006. <clears throat> so after the introduction of the near fall effects and researchers proposed that several possible causes of velocity pulses. According to our understanding of the cause of generating pulse-like velocity, although it's still limited now, but at least we know the rupture directivity effect and also the asperity effect and also the free step effect. And uh, the side effect may be another major reason, major cause to make the long period high amplitude velocity pulse in the near fall region. So um, Shahi and Baker, they try to propose uh, an objective approach to identify the velocity pulse. As you can see in this figure, the, fig the sub figure A shows a clear pulse waveform. But the, and the sub figure V show a clear non pulse waveform. But the sub figure C shows ambiguous waveform that we cannot determine it's a pulse or it's a non pulse directly. So, according to this approach proposed by Shai and Baker, we can use uh, the program with several criteria to determine whether waveform include a pulse-like velocity or not. This method, you, um, I try to, um, let me check, okay. This figure indicate that a pulse-like ground motion time history is broken down to three wavelengths. Oh, sorry, more than three wavelengths and some together again. Like this original ground motion, it can break it to several sub wavelengths and can construct it again. And the velocity pulse is identified according to two major criteria. One is PGV ratio. The other is energy ratio of the extracted wavelet. This is a figure shows original ground motion and the extracted pulse waveform. And this is a residual ground motion. With this idea, we can try to break every raker into several wavelets and try to identify if there is a velocity pulse included in the original waveform. The, identif the identification approach in this study is they use first the pulse indicator, the so-called PI. And uh, there is another supplementary parameter called PC. And once the PI larger than zero, it's a pulse-like velocity. Here shows the distribution figure of PGV and the principal component is a, uh, this is PC. <clears throat> and the point, the point is a data set from very, uh, from many, many different uh, strong motion records. 
uh, by using supporting vector machine technique. Uh, they try to delineate this curve as a boundary during post-light and non-post-light records. <clears throat> with the records with PI larger than zero, the red star, those records are identified as a post-light and others are non-post-light. Another, uh, another parameter they use are early occurrence of the post. Uh, the, research, the researchers believe the post in, uh, caused by near fall effect should be occurrence early in the waveform. So, they use uh, they propose the criteria that the total uh, <clears throat> the total energy of the original waveform uh, the seven the time of total energy to uh, of seventy percent of total energy of the original waveform if it's larger than the velocity, the pulse, the velocity pulse waveform, the five percent energy of velocity waveform, the the time. If the original time larger than five percent pulse like time, then it's a pulse like velocity. And if the time of communicated energy la larger than seventeen percent smaller than the time of post like energy communicated to 5%. If it's smaller than the, post, than the time of 5% uh, post energy, then it's a non-post like, uh, non like waveform. So according to the two different criteria, um, they can we can use a program automatic to determine a seismic waveform is a post-like or a non-post-like. <clears throat> and this is a result from another research. This here this figure shows several velocity waveforms, <clears throat> um, but divided to post-like and in the left and non post like in the right. Oh, sorry. Both these are post like ground motions, but in the left is the velocity waveform. In the right is acceleration waveform. And there are several of those waveforms are observed in Taiwan. One example is the TCU. 06A, this, this one. And another is TCU052, this one. Another is the TCU75 and also TCU129. And three years back in Taiwan, there is a Hualien earthquake, also has a station HWA. 14, also record, also record the post-like velocity I show in the same scale, the waveform I sh show in same scale here to compare with the previous records. So you can see the, T the waveform at TCU 68 and TCU 52, uh, they are still uh, the first place and second place of the largest uh, amplitude of near fall ground motions in the world with that ever record. So this is why the near fall strong motion with post-like velocity is very important, especially in Taiwan. <laughs> so we try to arrange the and constructed arranged data and constructed a database 
of near fall strong motions with post live velocity in Taiwan. We um, collect several uh, records in Taiwan and, in also, and also from uh, different other countries. In Taiwan, after we, we screen all of our strong motion stations, we have 180, 198 sets of time history from 22 different earthquakes have a post-like velocity ground motion. And in other countries, there are 112 sets of time history from 31 earthquakes. <laughs> and actually most of those, those time history were downloaded from the NGA West 2 database. From, by using those records, we can analyze the characteristic of uh, strong motion with post-like velocities. Like here shows the moment magnitude distribution, the distribution of moment magnitude uh, versus the uh, rupture distance. That is the station to the rupture plane. This is a data set in Taiwan and in other countries. And also, we show the peak ground acceleration versus the moment magnitude of the records in Taiwan and in other countries. And also we can check is the PGV, the relationship between PGV, peak ground velocity and the moment magnitude. And also moment magnitude and VS30 from each station. So we can use this data, the record from this database to do some research. And this is a technical report of, and a, a link to the website of this uh, database. <clears throat> this is several cases of the uh, events with post-like velocity. Like here, there is subduction event in the Southern Taiwan, and there are two or three stations record the ground motion with post-like velocity. And the gray area is the finite fall plane. And this is the uh, case from Chichi earthquake. There are many stations record the, record, recorded the, um, the strong motion with post-like velocity in this region. And this is a case from New Zealand. Kaikoura earthquake occurred in 2016. This is Loma Prieta earthquake in the California. And we also show the, the epicenter and the location of the station record the post-like velocity. <clears throat> After construction of this database, we try to study the rupture the relativity effect and the velocity poses in Taiwan <laughs> use the, the, the um, strong motion records. And here is the uh, distribution of the station and the epicenter, and also as well as the count of the uh, record with rupture the relativity effect versus different assumes of the direct related to the rupture directivity. You can see there are a lot of record number in the per, uh, aligned in the direction of rupture forward, re, forward direction. <clears throat> so we can use the ground motion model that is a so-called GMPE, ground motion prediction equation. This is a basic idea of the ground motion prediction equation. Um, engineering seismologists usually use the observed data like PGA in terms of different distance. And we can do a regression analysis using physical model <clears throat> to 
to analyze the attenuation characteristic uh, for the PGA along different distance. And then we can analyze the uh, data distribution and uncertainty, the median value and the uncertainty range. So this is important for engineering application because we have to know the probability of the ground motion is one and two standard deviation. So this is the ground motion model as an example NGA model used to for the um, regression. <clears throat> um, the log y, the y is the intensity measure and the different function account for magnitude, distance, and uh, uh, hand wall effects, uh, side effects, sedimentary effects, and at all. There are several different groups. They try to develop a different model using an identical database for the ground motion model analysis. <clears throat> One example from the A AS08 model. The equation from the median ground motion is in this case. There are several functions account for the source effects and uh, the side effects and also the heading wall effect, and also the source depth effect, and also the distance effect. Let's account for the path effect, and also the sedimentary depth effect. Using this physical basis model uh, or physical basis function, the, the GMM ground motion model can predict the median value of ground motion as well as their uncertainty. <laughs> so this is a way we would like to use it account for the rupture directivity effect. We adopted this equation as the directivity function I've modified from the previous studies. There are several important um, parameters we have known. We have, uh, is, is required in this model. One is the ratio between rupture velocity and the S wave velocity. The second is the angle between rate takeoff angle and the rupture direction. The third is the coefficient of percentage of the unilateral rupture. And the third is the deviation angle between primary and secondary rupture direction. And also as well as a constant term. <clears throat> With this function form, we can identify and define the derivative effect. I will not go to detail here, but if you are interested, you can uh, to look for the other reference. This is a case of an earthquake occurring in South Taiwan. As you can see, the record in different azimuths indicate by different colors, uh, the green, the blue, and the red. The blue and the red is the direction aligned with the rupture, forward rupture direction. And the green is the upside direction. So you can see the forward direction shows larger intensity in blue and in red. And in the, the data set uh, indicated by green is in the backward direction. In the same distance, it shows smaller ground motions in terms of PGA and PGB. So this is a characteristic of the strong directivity effect of the source rupture. So we try to identify the residual using the previous function. 
and we try to compare the prediction result without the directivity effect and with considering the directivity effect with the observed intensity. The number you can see here is the intensity, is indicated intensity. So this is a, a epicenter. You can see in this region, uh, the number is larger, so intensity is higher. And when the ground motion model do not include the directivity turn in this model, <clears throat> In this region, the strong the ground motion will underestimate. But when we include the directivity turn in this region, the predict value is close to the observed value. So uh, by the use of a ground motion model include a directivity turn, we can predict a ground motion more accurately. <clears throat> Another advantage in our near fall post like velocity database is that we try to keep the fling step of in our database for most of our uh, events with large magnitude. And the seismic waveform from NGA West 2 that is developed by peers um, are usually proposed by, uh, are usually uh, uh, proceed by a filter. So the process, filter process will cause the waveform destroyed, distorted by this filter. And uh, the result from entry can keep the displacement, uh, permanent displacement on the waveform. Like here, compared to here, peer tests do not have the permanent displacement. And this is another case. We try to keep the very long period permanent displacement on our in our uh, during our process. <clears throat> this is a structure damages during uh, <clears throat> several important seismic uh, strong motions in Taiwan. One is Chichi earthquake. You can see the bridge destroyed because the fall rupture just went close of this bridge <clears throat> and several building total collapse. During the Hualien earthquake, this hotel total collapse, the, the third floor become the first floor. And this is a bridge uh, price. And also during the Menong earthquake, there is a building with one Jinlong building <clears throat> total collapse here. And there was a highway shifted, uh, shifted uh, with a distance larger than 0.5 meter during the sh strong shaking. And also the water pipe was broken during this earthquake. So this uh, temporary water pipe uh, put on the road. <clears throat> this is ground motions and uh, structure damage because the higher structure usually vibrated during the long period shaking. So the long period post median is sensitive to high rise building and isolation equipment pipeline at zero. And the vertical motion is important for the floor and also ceiling suspension pipe and the fling actually is important for long span bridge pipeline. And the vibration duration is important to soil liquefaction. So when we analyze the damage for different type of structure, 
we have to know which kind of strong motion characteristics are sensitive to different types or different components of the structures or non-structures. And we have to try to capture the significant component of ground motion for different types of structures. This is a shake table we just introduced. <clears throat> we, use, we use this shaking table, um, apply prediction context of seismic response and sufficient modeling techniques for a, a health scale seven store reference concrete frame buildings involve near fall effects and also the soft or weak first floor condition was, was uh, <coughs> conducted. This is a specimen. This is a uh, content poster. And this is a result. We can see the lower result means the X, XAO means the maxima story drift. And the Y XL means story number. So they are total seven floor and uh, maxima story drift was occur in the first floor. So we can see the drift was, was tremendously large in the first floor compared to in the others. So the, if the soft or weak first store was exist and the uh, buildings are, are tend to be destroyed during this earthquake. Um, this is an example, sorry, this is an example of post-like and non post-like ground motions on, on a structure. <clears throat> this epicenter, we select two, two records at, from two different stations. One is a station of the, at the direction of rupture for war. And another is in the backward direction. So you can see the station at forward region and the backward region have similar PGA in the north-south component and the east-west component, the stations in the forward directivity region has large, larger PGA about two times of the other one. However, when it goes to PGV, that is velocity. <clears throat> the station located on the rupture for war re region have a much larger PGV compared to that in the backward direction, about larger than five or six times of PGV, as you can see here. So this is caused by the different significant period of the ground motions. So what is the influence of those ground motion on structure? We can see uh, by this video. This is a this is a, a shake table test from using by using the non post light breaker. And uh, because the shake is mostly in very high frequency, so you cannot see any vibration of the structure by naked eye. However, when we use the uh, post-like velocity as the input motion, you will see very obvious displacement. And if you need to understand it, you will be first floor because this is a waste. We see significant damage on the first floor because this is a weak or soft floor in the first story condition. So with this video, you can know even the same distance from an epicenter, 
the location is very important as for the uh, related to the direction of fall rupture. <clears throat> In addition, we also use numerical simulation to simulate uh, building response. Um, in the left is the alpha is 0.2. It indicates compar comparatively weak building. And the right is a model with comparative strong buildings. <clears throat> we use multiple degree of freedom model to simulate with different input to simulate the structural response. You can see the dash line include the simulated result by using non-post-like uh, ground motion as the input motion. And the solid line is the result of using post-like velocity as the input motion. <clears throat> The case A on the upper on the upper column is without considering of the button stiffness reduction. This means uh, we suppose no soft layer for the case A. But for the case B, we set 30% reducted button shear story stiffness and shear strength. So we suppose there is a soft layer as the first story of, uh, on the case B. So you can see the X indicate the story ductivity ratio. And actually it means the shift of the uh, ductivity. So the stretch ductivity ratio indicate the maxima inter-story drift normalized by the story yield drift. So we can see there is a larger, is the largest story drift in the first floor, <clears throat> as you can see in the weak building or in the strong building. And the parameter setting actually is referred to Taiwan's building code for others. So for both the shock table test and also the numerical simulation, we can see the, if there is a soft, soft or weak. Story of a hybrid on the soft layer. So this is a summary. Ground motion usually with large amplitude and abnormal distribution near for region. And the post like velocity is just one of the significant effect we should be considered with caution in seismic design. Seismic demand of structure is therefore increased in near fall region because near fall effect have not been considered well in the current design code in Taiwan. Different structures are sensitive to different components of ground motions. So before analysis, <clears throat> the damage characteristic of a, of a structure, you have to know what kinds of intensity measure is sensitive to. And both the shake table test and numerical simulation indicate that the soft weak first door may be the major collapse mechanism for building suffer near for post like ground motion. This is my uh, presentation today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Guo, for very interesting uh, presentation for today. And uh, now uh, we will uh, have a discussion section. And for everyone that have any question, you can write down your question in the chat box, or you can raise your hand, please. Okay, if there is any question from the students.
Okay, uh, maybe I will start uh, my question for uh, you, Professor Kuo. Uh, okay. In the previous uh, slide, you uh, present that uh, there is uh, in the hanging wall position, uh, there will be uh, more effect than the other position if uh, there is uh, an earthquake. Uh, can you explain uh, one more time uh, what, uh, why, why this uh, happened? Okay. Oh, thanks for the question. About the hanging wall effect, actually the, um, is a, of the effect is one of the, is one of the important near fall effects mm -hmm. um, um, on engineering seismology. And actually is the, it can be said the first well-studied well near fall effects in the part in the previous studies <clears throat> because the engineers as much um they from previous earthquake record they found that they're usually more significant or more uh, severe damage for the structures on the hanging wall region compared to the region of food wall from several large earthquake, the engineers and the seismologists found the, the phenomena. And uh, this is because if this is a profile, as we can see in the, this slide, and uh, this is a very full rupture plan in here. So this is a deep, deep fall. And uh, in this region is a so-called hanging wall region in the, in the right. In the left is a hanging wall region, right? And once this active fall rupture, the rupture plan, the seismic energy or seismic wave radiation will propagate of S wave, especially for S wave, that usually cause the building damage. The seismic wave radiated from the four plane. So with the same distance of D from the four rupture plane, the station located here suffer more radiation energy than the station in food wall with the same distance. So actually, this is also because the geometry and location of this fall rupture. So the hanging wall, during the hanging wall region with a, 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 with the same distance, <clears throat> the station here usually suffer more radiation energy from seismic wave from the, from the fall rupture, during the fall rupture compared to the station as a full wall region. So this is the reason um, if we analyze the, the seismic record at the handy wall station and the full wall station, we can see for the horizontal ground motion and for the vertical ground motion, um, uh, we can calculate the amplification factor in a log scale. So with the zero means the amplification factor is one. So means no amplification. However, both the horizontal component and the vertical component, horizontal shows in circle, vertical shows in square, open square. With this is different period. The, P, the show period shows larger and perfection factor compared to long period in both horizontal and vertical. Yes. And according to the record vertical, uh, horizontal is higher than the vertical for the hanging wall effect. So uh, this is some explanation of the hanging wall effect. Okay, Th thank you very much, Professor Paul.
You are welcome. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then uh, we have another question in the chat box. There is uh, three question. One is from uh, Miss Erina, and two is from Miss Kesia, and three from Mr. Fermiro. Uh, you can pick the question and then uh, oh, answer. Hey, okay. um, the first is: Could you please explain us again about rupture directivity and its importance? to be included in the ground motion assessment. Okay, so as for the first question, <clears throat> the directivity effect we can show by this slide. This is epicenter. And when epicenter is a, is a point that the rupture initiates during an earthquake. So in this case, the the fault rupture to the, to the north direction. And there are three segments of the active of this fault. So to the north is the, is the direction of the rupture forward. And the, and the backward direction is to the south. <clears throat> so to the forward, uh, for, at the location of forward rupture, the um, in site much we usually use uh, the so-called source time function to define the energy release rate, and in the toward direction, as we can see here, there are several triangles we use to identify the source time function. As we can show, there are some uh, triangles like here, uh, slight gray triangles, and we can make it together as a total source time function. So this is the same in this case. The source time function is the so-called seismic energy release rate. <clears throat> uh, and usually in the forward directivity region, the rupture have a, usually have a velocity nearly 0.8 of the um, S-wave velocity. So the rupture is just behind the wave propagation to the nose. And the energy release, uh, uh, the seismic energy can be released a lot during a very short time. So this makes the seismic wave concentrated in the narrow frequency band. So this makes the seismic wave concentrated in a narrow um, period. And the period is usually during one second to several seconds. And the amplitude is concentrated to a large, large amplitude. So we can see the, um, the peak ground velocity is large, even larger than 100 centimeter per second for this case. This is a rupture directivity effect. And uh, for the component of trinormal, for the horizontal trinormal component, usually the far field SH wave radiation uh, Patent try to make the two side um, velocity poles. And for the component of triparallel, triparallel here, it's usually the, the permanent displacement try to make the one side velocity poles. So this is the the reason to make or to generate a post-like velocity during an earthquake. Um, we try to check the second question. Um, design the oil and gas platform for 
official drilling, my question is, is there any tools to minimize the force from the earthquake to the oil and gas platform on the offshore? Okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I don't understand too much about the offshore oil and gas platform, but I think um, um, it's difficult to it's difficult to minimize or to prevent the force from the earthquake to the platform to the offshore platform. Uh, but we are lucky that this kind of large magnitude earthquake, uh, the probability of this kind of large Magnitude earthquake occur is very is very low, especially for a uh, for a uh, um, <clears throat> for a specific location for the platform. I think maybe no significant problem for the for the platform. Maybe uh, you have other more significant problem for this. Uh, for the platform safety than the uh, near fall ground motions. Because if you would like to generate this kind of large post, large velocity post, um, you have to up uh, up uh, a seismic source, important seismic source have to be exist close to the platform. That means the platform have to be installed near a subduction room. And I'm not sure if you are platform or if there are many platform installed near the subduction room. I am not uh, familiar with this question. So yeah, my, my suggestion is, is uh, limited for this question. Yeah. So maybe we come to the third question. Which one have bigger effect to the building between depths of the earthquake? Um, the duration of the earthquake or the position between the earthquake and the building. Do you have a suggestion for any criteria for the development, development of building to be as safe as possible from earthquake? Thank you. <clears throat> um, Okay, I think the bigger effect to a building, of course, the depth of earthquake is also important uh, consideration for building because the depth of earthquake is related to the distance from the earthquake to a building. And the duration of the earthquake is related to the magnitude of an earthquake. So the larger earthquake, usually the large magnitude earthquake, when a building is still in a in a place, um, um, that if a building, um, the ground motion. Uh, to a building, <clears throat> the most important is the first, the magnitude. Once the magnitude is large, the effect on the building is significant. And the second is distance. Once the fault, fault rupture plan close to the building and the shaking will be significant to to the uh, to the building, so I think all of the effects you mentioned are also are very important for the building uh, safety assessment. 
And do you have suggestion for any criteria to develop of the building to be accepted as possible from earthquake? Okay, my suggestion is um, you have to study the uh, possible seismic source in terms of regional source or active source or subduction source, subduction on source. And then after study the source characteristic, you have to study the path effect of, of a specific region. Um, that will influence your seismic wave attenuation uh, characteristic in a specific region. And then is a side effect of this region. After you study the source path and side effect of the region, you can have a, a, a <clears throat> throughout development of a ground motion model. And then you can conduct a seismic hazard assessment for this region. And then you can design the structure or buildings according to the hazard assessment result. And then you can try to keep your building as safe as possible uh, based on the foundation of, of seismology science. Yeah, this is my suggestion. Okay, thank you uh, for the very nice uh, discussion uh, by us again. And uh, is there any question again? Okay, uh, Paul Hyudi, there is any uh, comment or remarks? Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm interested in knowing more about uh, Tainan Laboratory. So, uh, what can we do there in the uh, laboratory? Tainan oh, Laboratory. Tainan. Yeah. Is it open for guests to <laughs> visit, for example? Yeah, yeah, it's open for visitors. Um, um, uh, we usually, our laboratory, we have two laboratories. One is in Taipei and another is in Tainan. Uh, I should say Anqui have two laboratories. <clears throat> mm. Okay, so one is in Taipei, one is in Tainan. And in Tainan, Anqui has uh, a newer uh, facilities. One is a bad system. Another is a new high-speed earthquake simulator. And uh, it's open for the uh, visitors or researchers or students and teachers. They can apply for visiting. Mm -hmm. And according to their schedule, and then Anqui will send a, 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 a people a sky to, to introduce the uh, facilities for the visitors. And if you are lucky, at the same day, there, there, there are some uh, experiments and maybe you can see the, the experiment if you are visited at the same time. Yeah, so it's open for public, no problem. Okay. Is there any yeah. uh, enough information in uh, your website? about this Tainan lab? About this Tainan lab, um, I think you can find some information from mm -hmm. the, the website of Anchory. Mm -hmm. I think, okay. Um, <clears throat> this is the website of Anqui and laboratories. Okay, let's introduce, but this is for Taipei. Um, do we have 
Um, maybe I will ask and maybe I can send, I know in Chinese version, there should be some introduced for the Tainan lab, but for the English version website, I'm not sure. Maybe I can send you the information after this talk. Okay. Yeah, about Tainan laboratory. Okay, yeah. And maybe the last uh, question about uh, shaking table test. Where can we conduct this test? Shaking table test. Shaking table test. Yeah. Uh, you said where? Uh, can you speak your question again? Could yeah, you? There is a you, slide about. Yeah. Uh, seeking table test. Uh, where can we conduct this test? In which where? laboratory? Okay. Um, uh, we have uh, both the uh, laboratory of Angry in Taipei and Tainan have mm. a shared table. Um, however, in uh, for the shared table in Taipei is a uh, uh, five meter multiplied by five meter, smaller shake table. And in the Tainan is a larger, eight meter by eight meter and a new, mm -hmm. and a new shake table. And uh, as I know, um, the researchers or some private companies can, can rent the shake table to do some tests. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, both in shake table in Taipei and Tainan. And actually we have, uh, Anqui has other smaller scale and more easy to operate smaller shake table, like maybe a, a unidirectional component and mm -hmm. uh, maybe one about one meter multiplied by one meter. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. another smaller size shake table also can provide and uh, but I'm not sure if for uh, the foreigner users, I'm not sure for the detail, maybe have to contact with the uh, entry to check the, the how, how to use, because as I know, um, mm -hmm. the, uh, it, uh, as I know, the researcher applied for the use of shaking table they have to design their, their test and they have to make their specimen. So if a, if a foreigner uh, researcher would like to use a shake table test to do some test, usually they have to have co collaboration with a, with a local professor or local researcher in Taiwan, then it will be more easy to for the design of the specimen and design for the uh, for the test test. Yeah, that is the case I know. Yeah. But both okay. in Taipei and Tainan have, have shake table and can be can be rent for the researcher and professor and also private company. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the conversation, but we have to end the class before the duration. But uh, before that, maybe do you have any closing remarks uh, for this school uh, for this uh, lecture? Oh, closing remark. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I would uh, just like to uh, respond for a uh, uh, from the students that I will leave my uh, PowerPoint slides as PDF file to you, to share with you. And uh, um, hopefully uh, you can visit the, the links of the institutes in Taiwan. And uh, if you are interested in the, 
our institute or our our department will come to to study in Taiwan. Yeah, <clears throat> and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, um, and again, I am very happy to meet you here in this video course. Thank you for your invitation. Okay, thank you very much once again. And uh, uh, this is uh, the end of uh, our uh, session for today. And for students, uh, tomorrow we will uh, begin the class at uh, 1 p.m. Indonesian time. And uh, uh, it means that uh, today's session is end. And uh, we thank for Professor Kuo, uh, please. I'll uh, give applause for Professor Kuo uh, for the lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. thanks for all thank audience. You. And thank you for chairman. Thank you for Professor Wildy. Thank you all of you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Okay, so I will leave now. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. See bye you bye. next time. Bye bye. See bye. you next time. Thank you. <laughs>